See, this is the stuff I don't usually get to talk about, but these are the deeper reasons why we need to operate the way we need to operate. See, we get to talking about things in a present tense moment, right? And understanding things from a position that, you know, eating right. They say, well, I understand that, but hey, bro, I want to just take the vax. Okay. Well, after you take it, you still go be susceptible to the diabetes, the heart issues, right? The arthritis and the multitude of different things that we have as pre-existing conditions because only a lifestyle change will matter. You may save some people in the moment, but what about years to come when we consistently find ourselves with the same issue that's prevalent? Whose message is going to save more lives, mine or yours? Now, that's the question that we got to ask ourselves. So I'm going to get deeper. Since y'all dropping them 19s, I'm going to go ahead and get a little deeper then. Now, you got to understand that mathematics is reality, right? There's something that they call ontological mathematics. Mathematics that's not just an abstract tool, but has real world application and real existence. Mathematics of energy. Numbers that exist in space time that have real energy, not just numbers written on paper that have no true properties. So I think of it like this, becoming a mathematical observer, right? If you come up with a certain formula, the universe is what they find mathematical formulas, right? And these become our universal laws, literally. Two scientists from different parts of the world that speak different languages can communicate utilizing mathematics. It is a language. In fact, our English language, each one had a numerical value. A1, right? 2B, 3C, D4, right? It's a mathematical language. So when we observe numbers, we observe in the patterns and frequencies of the universe, a lot of people say, well, Keith, what do synchronicity mean then when I see 444s and 555s and 111s and all of this 999s? Well, what is that? When something is repeated, it's a pattern. When it's repeated, it's happening what? Frequently. So once it happens frequently, it becomes what? A frequency. Right? Now, the greater question is this. If you study physics, quantum physics... Then you start to understand in quantum physics, they talk about observation. Everything is based upon observation. Time itself is based upon observation. Now, there's something that's called the slit test that they study that when you observe atoms, they behave differently. When you measure observe atoms, they behave differently. Which means that consciousness affects reality. Which also would mean to me that a high level conscious observer would have a greater level of effect on reality. And a low level observer would have a lower effect on reality. So what one thing means to me and what one thing means to you would be different. That's the reason I can go find synchronistic observations, things that will otherwise be coincidental and meaningless to a low level observer, I can apply meaning to it and I create the meaning that I apply. So when you see these numbers, you are supposed to apply the meaning as the observer because you created the observation. See, what does it mean to be a low level or a high level observer? A low level of observer is controlled by what they see. A high level observer controls what they see. Come on with it, man. So my world gets deeper by the minute because I am creating the meaning within my world. So everybody can't go that deep. But when you go that deep, see, you give yourself a gift. And this is one thing that we got to stop doing with the world. That's too deep.
That's too deep is the greatest robbery of higher consciousness ever given on the planet. Why? Because imagine if you told that to a seed that's sitting on top of soil. No, that seed has to go into the darkness. It has to be firmly planted so it can be rooted. And once it's rooted deep, then it can apply pressure and begin to go against gravity. And then beginning to create roots in a trunk and it becomes a tree. And this tree creates branch knowledge. See, most of us only want branches of the knowledge. We don't go to root knowledge and we are taught in the nation to go to the root. Maswar Muhammad, who taught the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, had root knowledge. And once you go get root knowledge, you can create the branches of knowledge. And once you create the branches of knowledge, they bear fruit. And some of us don't even go get branches of knowledge. We get fruit knowledge. See, we only learn from others perspective. We never investigate for our own interpretation. Now, the dangerous thing of that is that when you only go in to get the fruit knowledge, you never had a power to create the tree. You don't have the experience. But see, a tree has the power to consistently replenish itself. That tree dropped that fruit. See, some people, they enjoy the fruit. It tastes good, but they couldn't tell you how to make that fruit. They couldn't tell you the operation of planting those seeds, which is why we see people and throughout time, there's only so many phenomenal people on this planet Earth. And by phenomenal, I mean those who stand out as a phenomenon. I want you to think about that for a second. Those who stand out as a phenomenon. We are synchronistic events ourselves when we walk in the room. That is a phenomenal event. But why out of all these billions of people, how come history only gives us a handful? Think about that. History only has a hand full of people. It's only so many interesting thinkers because not everybody goes to the root to create their own fruit. Most of us just like the taste in the branches of knowledge that we give in. So therefore we add nothing to the course of history. So why would you be remembered? If you didn't add anything to so you can become good at understanding another's perspective. But how does that benefit and impact humanity if you didn't give anything from your own mind? See, this is what we do when we tap into the 19. We tap into the mind of God. We crystallize our thoughts and we stop asking people to dumb it down for those who don't understand and instead we teach those and so that everybody can smarten up so that we can get to a place where the young generation is learning calculus. The study and the constant rate of change. So that we find ourselves not still because a people who stand still has no time. Your time cannot come if you're standing still. If everything in the world stood still, there is no time. Time is the measurement of motion. So how can we determine what time we are as a people if we look at statistically we own the same thing as when we were slaves, then time has stood still since 1865. Time has stood still since 1919 or 1921. If the nation is not as further or progressed as when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was here, then there is an aspect of time standing still proportionate to the business and the ownership capabilities. So we all have a responsibility to progress and move time forward. And that is going to be what we do. And what we add on to. 
We don't look and wait for someone else to do it. We produce it so we can move each other forward. And then we add on to time. But we have to become trinary thinkers. And the reason I wanted to have this conversation today is particularly for that reason. If we are dealing with artificial intelligence, how do we defeat something like that? That has this vast capability of mathematical computation that can not only do binary code, but trinary and quinary thinking. Meaning it's not just thinking about left or right as an option. It's not just thinking as one and zero. But wait a minute. How about this computing, not just one, zero, but there's a middle lane of mathematical computation. It's not just left or right. There's up, there's down. There's forward, there's backwards. And so we're thinking in these senses to where the options that was given to us are no longer the choices that we choose because now we're not thinking binary. We're not thinking job, college, marriage, success. No, we thinking produce my own business, create a trust with my wife and put us under a contract that we have with each other so we can produce wealth because we start to compute different options because we have different means. We are a generation that gets to create the root of our world. And we can determine that because we have a different level of means that no other generation has had before. And we become the controllers of the artificial intelligence. Otherwise, they will control us. So how do we get there? Imagination will be the architect of our future. Now, when I say something like that, they say, okay, Keys, I thought you was going to give me something different. Imagination is it? Imagination is the key. That's the key to God. The kingdom of heaven. Imagination. Why? Look around at your environment right now. Wherever you are. Look around left, right, up, down. Look at the door handle. Look at the ceilings. For the most part, it's about the same everywhere. Door handles will turn a certain way so you can open it. The design of your world is created by someone else for the most part. But there's a limitation Utilizing your eyes. Your eyes can limit your mind. Because if you look around utilizing your sight, then you will only think about the resources that you have as far as the potential a reality that you can produce when that's not the re that's not the case. Nah, see, you don't want to be limited by your sight. When you could be limitless with your mind. So meaning that I could be a child in the hood. Talk with a great imagination. To imagine a completely different version of myself. A completely different reality. A completely different world. A completely different future. So now in my mind I'm living completely a different above my circumstances. So now I have a vision. And see in my mind time is different. Time is different. There is the time that we deal with when it comes through clocks. We measure physical time with clocks, right? But there's an immaterial time that we measure with emotion and feeling. Right? We feel time and then there's physical time. One is measured by feeling and one is measured by clocks and watches. So... That's why a person be like, damn, I feel like this is taking forever. But you can look at your watch. It was only five minutes. But if you're enjoying yourself, it goes fast. So in your mind, when you're stimulated with a vision and you do the things that you love, which is producing that vision outward, time speeds up. And you speed up towards producing that vision, controlling your time. Talk to me, man. I'm going to give y'all the formula, man, every time. So that if we teach a level of mastery, of lucid dreaming, and imaginative 
architecture. Then this becomes the easy part. Okay. I've imagined every aspect of my future and my vision. I've got it down to a detail. I know what I want to look like that day. I know what I want to feel like. I know who I want to be. I know the feeling I want to have. I know what I want to be wearing, what I'm going to smell like, what the lighting, the temperature in the room. I got this down to a science. It's in my head. All right, well, step one to taking that car, that's a precept. That's the thought forming. But once it's fully formed, it becomes the concept. You take that concept, you write that down. That's the first step to bring it into reality. It goes from this dimension into that third dimension. Three dimensions in which you can measure it. In that fourth dimension, you can see it. There is no limit. So then we say, all right, what's the next step? Good question. Here's the, I'm going to give y'all a secret. For what your imagination can think of, they've created these machines. You can ask a question to figure out how it gets done. Now, every generation, they had these machines. Every generation, they had these machines. But now we got these machines that the moment I think of something, I can ask a machine how to do it. I can study. I can research. I can utilize my imagination and now it's not particularly based off my hard work or my smart work, but my creative work. Because the machines give us the means. It's not about our horsepower or our manpower. We are no longer limited by that. We were limited by that for a moment. That we had to think about the amount of energy we had to exert in the force over a distance to measure the effectiveness and our productivity, which why the rulers of men and horses were the one who controlled the world because they could move time faster. They controlled the production. So it went from the horses, then we created steams. We had these different industrial revolutions. We had the printing press. They came up with the phones. Then we had the internet. The light, all of these were revolutions that changed the way men, the way mind was able to think and move about the world in reality. And the Internet, this particular revolution. This is something that our generation is going through and is still in its baby stages. And then there's another one as well that's on top of this, and that's the blockchain and artificial intelligence. Meaning that. I am no longer limited by my means because of my access. And this access gives me wealth. Like a phone, we call it a phone. And I want y'all to think of this thing in a completely reimagine what you consider a phone. Because at a time, a phone was literally something you use to rotate and make a call. You would talk to someone on the other end. You would dial out. Toot, 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 toot. Send another, send a signal. Hey, how you doing? This is for communication. Then these phones transformed, but they still called it a phone. But they never changed it because you can still make calls, but it became way more than that. It became more than that. It became a satellite briefcase, an operation. It became an artificial intelligence, it became a library in your pocket. It became a, a studio. You, we started to have cybernetic consciousness because we connected to it. You won't come for your teeth. Teeth. So we became connected to these things. Our memory is stored in the phone, not in our minds for the most part. They become extensions of it. So whether we know it or not, we are cyborgs. Think about it for a second. I'm trying to get y'all some game on this bit 19. So what does that mean? That means that if I create an idea in my imagination, I now have a machine that can help me bring it into reality. 
that I can take an idea that I otherwise don't have resources for. I can present it to this machine, whether it's social media, whether it's giving myself the necessary value and information. And then guess what? Oh, I can manifest it. See, think about this for a second. If you want to think about different dimensions, you could think about different cellular communication levels. 4G gave us this high internet speed. Things became capable like streaming. Now you can stream your thoughts to millions upon millions of people. The YouTube, the face, Facebooks, the Instagrams, the Snapchats, they become possible. A different world of application came out because of our 4G. The world changed. Your access around the world was now capable. You could become a global thought leader. See, oftentimes we regard genius as this phenomenon that only happens to a small subset of the population. But I'm going to give you an example to why the average person is a genius, but you may never know. Einstein came up with his theories. He did them all in his mind. He did what they call thought experiments. He tapped into that fourth, fifth dimension. They say he also did different experimental drugs, psilocybin or something. But he was working at a patent office. Right, you know, a patent office is where the white man created the patent office to steal ideas. Black man ain't create no patent office. We had so many, we need, we need a patent for it. Right, he did that so he can steal ideas. That's what the patent office was created for. So he was there thinking, not only why he was working, but on his off time. And his friend convinced him, hey, say, man, publish them papers, bro. Publish them papers for peer review and scientific journals. He published one paper. Outstanding. It hit. Didn't have the effect that he wanted it to have. Right? Fast forward, he published his theory of relativity. Now, this was scrutinized. See, in science, you have to be disproved for something to be approved. Right? Your theories. If you can't disprove it, well, shit, it becomes a new paradigm. And he was challenging Newton's law. He was challenging the whole paradigm of science. So he came up with this and the scientists around the world were scrutinizing it. One went so far that he tried to disprove it. He had to go to another country. He had to wait for an eclipse. He had to do a bunch of different shit. And by him trying to disprove Einstein's thoughts, he end up proving it. And I think about that in this sense. Because Einstein was hailed as the first celebrity genius. So I'm utilizing him as an example. But we have way more people that are geniuses from our culture, but they didn't give us a measurement to measure genius and definitely not measure celebrity genius in our culture today. The geniuses in our culture are the most ostracized ones because we are the disruptors. So you coming up with a new thought and they're challenging you with the old thought. So I say that to say this, if he kept his thoughts in his head and he never published that paper and the world never set out to disagree with him. How would you able to measure his genius? He could have died an old man working in a patent office, but had the theory of relativity in his head. You could have talked to him, could have walked past him. You would have measured him as a small, meek man with no real value. And some of you all are just like that. 
genius, amazing ideas, but you never present them to the world. I don't mean you're not a genius. Just because it's silent, just because it remains in you, but you have to bring it outward. And that's what the genius is. It is bringing that light outward. Everybody has it. Don't be afraid of the scrutiny. Don't be afraid of the peer review. It takes courage to act in the face of fear. It takes courage to act in the face of fear, not the absence of fear. See, we get comfortable, and when we find the absence of fear, that's when we move. But when we become comfortable acting in the face of fear, that's when we become powerful. That's growth. Don't wait for the fear to be subsided. Act, even though it's there. That's the true power. I'll leave y'all with the last 19. And this one is about the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He said when he was 19, and I want to make sure I get this quote right. So when the Honorable, Lodge, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was 19 years old, he heard that God chose a messenger for his people. He asked, why didn't God choose him? And then he thought, I wasn't even born. <laughs> and that's when he decided he was going to give his life for his people now I find that significant you see people grabbing guns and stuff <laughs> and like a Glock 19 <laughs> I find that significant that he told that story and I can find many 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 more 19's but I think that this particular story stream and frequency was for you all today and also i want y'all to understand this man made that decision at 19 years old and he's still going in 2000 what decision are you gonna make over your life here we are on the 19th the last 19th of 2020 and you here receiving this message for a reason you here receiving this message for a reason. Not here by accident. You have to find the meaning and why. What are you supposed to take from this message? Develop, develop, develop yourself into the mind of God. Do not go into the next year wasting your time. We know how precious and how valuable time is. And when you understand and study time, you can understand that you can control time itself. But you have to begin. Now, we will be going into a different world. And the opportunity, some of you all to go with us, is apparent. And I want to see y'all come with us. Everybody can't go. The mothership, they said it's only going to be 144,000. Everybody can't go. When you hear that, that shouldn't deter you. It should inspire you. It should inspire you because you know that you're going to be one of those 1%. It should inspire you because you're going to be one of the 1%. See, some people say, oh, man. It's not for everybody. I'm not going to make it. And then you're not. But for those who say, yeah, it don't matter if it was 10 people going, I'm one. Because I'm going to qualify myself to make sure that I'm going to be aboard. And I want you to understand this. And as I close with this, me and Queen of Four had a conversation. And we talked about why this year so many people that have been doing their work for years was finally able to see a compensation, a level of benefit, some riches, some success from it. 
Why were these people granted this much success this year? Conscious with cash, rich and righteous, wealthy with wisdom. Why did that happen this year? And all these years we've been waiting for the world to shift and the world to change to come into our favor. There's so many years people have done work for decades and they still didn't see the type of results that they wanted to in their lifetime and it deterred some people and they gave up and they quit before the mothership came. This year was like the mothership. It came, but you weren't qualified. You quit beforehand. Yeah, you did work 30 years up until now. And you retired. So you weren't prepared. You weren't ready to reap the benefits. It was about those people who are prepared in the time at the right time. You have to be on time and in time. So kudos to everybody who had a beautiful year. I want you to remember now that you've got a taste of heaven. It's time to be able to learn how to create it because you don't want to be like that person that tastes the fruit, but don't understand the root. I'm in love with the branches of knowledge that comes from the tree of knowledge, but don't understand the root of knowledge. Because once you learn how to create it for yourself, you can sustain it for the next generation. It's not something that one generation enjoys. Some of our great grandparents enjoyed some wealth. They enjoyed some money and some success during their time on the planet. But when we were born, we didn't have that same ability. Do you want your next generation that comes after you to be fighting for the same things that we fighting for today? Or do you want to be the catalyst that the next generation can build upon things that were left for them? 